Um, my name is Archibald Cunningham. I'm appearing on behalf of um, Ron Pierce and the class regarding the um, vexatious litigant statute. Um, <coughs> so our challenge is um, to the constitutionality of the vexatious litigant statute. We have no intention to try to overturn the entire vexatious litigant statute, but our, our challenge is in the context of custody cases. Um, and, and in that sense, um, we think this case stands why is, the, why is the Chief Justice a proper defendant in this case? Well, um, one of the issues is um, when you attack the constitutionality of a statute, who's a party? So I think there's a Ninth Circuit case saying well, that right. you have to have um, state action. So if we didn't name her as a judicial defendant, we would have had the issue of private parties, and we would have had to... Well, you may have no one as a proper defendant. I'm just wondering what the theory mm -hmm. is of having the Chief Justice of California as, as the defendant in this case. Um, strictly to um, have a judicial defendant and to avoid... Well, you can't just name somebody. You can't just pick some, a name out of a hat. There's got to be a reason. There's got to be somebody... Uh, this has to be somebody that's causing you harm or that can grant you relief. Well, I mean, as I understand it, you, you and your clients mm -hmm. get put on this list by meeting certain criteria. The putting on the list right. is by judicial order issued by a court, usually a superior court in California, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yes, I mean, yes. I, I just want to make sure I'm on the right track here, right? right. And the, what puts you on the list is an order of the court, which is then appealable through the judicial system all the way to the uh, California Supreme Court, presumably. But what does the, well, the, judicial, what does the judicial council have to do with any of this? Well, the Chief Justice is um, in charge of the Judicial Council, and under the state constitution, she what, regulates... What, what, is, what is their function in this process? Well, one of, one of her functions is to create forms. She creates forms. So after you're labeled vexatious, the state um, has Judicial Council forms issued. Those are controlled by the Chief Justice and the Commission um, on ju in her capacity as the head of the Commission on Judicial Performance. She creates the forms that regulate um, how a vexatious litigant obtains permission to file after being declared vexatious. So there's something called an MC702 form, which is a one-page form, which essentially has three boxes on it, which gives the presiding judge or the presiding justice um, the opportunity to check one of those two boxes. The third box is, allows for dialogue explaining why somebody who's been declared vexatious may or may not file in the district. But you don't need the form to have somebody put on uh, may declare the vexatious litigant. There's a statute that says it. I mean, a form is just a convenience. It's a shorthand way of letting the judge uh, make right, a decision, but, but the, the judge could just as easily enter a, uh, an order you know, right. a, a textual order saying uh, uh, Ron Pierce or um, Archibald Cunningham is a vexatious litigant, and then you'd be a vexatious litigant, and uh, you'd have to deal with the consequences, right? Right. I, I believe I was responding to your question about why the Chief Justice was named as a, a defendant, and so but I was counsel, just... I'm not sure you, you, you hit it. If I could just spend one, one more minute on this, sure. because... Because my problem with this is how it is she's supposed to grant relief. How is the chief justice supposed to uh, prevent superior court judges from declaring a litigant a vexatious litigant? Um, <clears throat> because, I, because I don't think the form is the problem. It seems to me the, 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 the question is that there's a statute that provides for that type of a declaration by a superior court judge. And I don't see how, how the chief justice could prevent enforcement of that statute. Sure. Um, again, you know, our, our challenge is a constitutional challenge to the statute. Um, in terms of the parties listed, um, I'm not sure if that's necessarily the issue either. Um, 
we did ask for um, injunctive relief, um, you know, for the district court to declare that the... Um, the, the, the problem is, it, in order to get any kind of relief, you've got to have a party that has the power to, you know, if, if compelled to do something, that will grant you relief. You're also under uh, RISA versus Good. You've got to have a wrongdoing party. Um, it's a long-standing case. I, it was, uh, right. That, so, that, that said, you know, what has the Chief Justice done right. that has done you and your clients wrong? Right. So what you're saying is that there is an Article Three case in controversy with um, the Chief Justice. The issue that we have in filing this is challenging the statute. Um, to get around the procedural hurdle of a proper defendant, judicial defendant, we could have um, conceivably sued all the private parties and then had the issue of um, how those private parties are engaged in um, state action. So in order to avoid that, we, we sued um, her in her official capacity as the um, chair well, of the chief. You, uh, could, you could name the judges that entered the specific orders, but then you back yourself into a Rooker-Feldman problem. Well, the Rooker uh, Feldman you know, problem. So if, if, right. you name the, if you name the judges who put you on the list, you, 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 I'm not sure you don't have a Rooker Feldman problem anyway. Because well, essentially, essentially what you're doing is you're attacking these orders. Uh, um, that, I mean, not, not the form, but right. the, the, the fact that judges have entered orders naming your think, clients. Yeah, I understand. I think in the Ninth Circuit case of um, Wolf. Um, versus um, Strankman, that issue came up as well. And the court said and dismissed all the judicial defendants who were, who, who were named. But they said that you could sue the chief justice as a party um, to maintain the action. And then also in um, that case, they raised the issue of whether or not a judge is acting in a um, judicial capacity when they issue pre-filing orders. Um, they didn't resolve it on that, but they did then get to the issue that I'm trying to get to, which is the constitutionality of the vexatious litigant statute. In Wolf versus Strikeman, they allowed a suit against the um, Chief Justice. At that time, it was Chief Justice George of the California Supreme Court in their official capacity. And then in George versus Wolf, they went on to discuss the issue of, not, of, of whether or not um, the challenge, the constitutional challenge, should be done on a rational review basis or whether it should be done on a heightened scrutiny. And in Wolf versus George, um, the Ninth Circuit decided that rational review was the proper level of review. Why, we, why are we bound by that? Now they're skipping forward to the merits. Right. Why aren't we bound to say, well, this is rational basis review, and we've already held I'm it. saying we've already held it's rational. Well, I think the general rule is that in pre-filing fee cases, um, rational review is the typical measure of of review. What we've said, and what we're trying to say in our case, is that. Um, this is distinguishable from Wolf versus George because it involves, like Bodie versus Connecticut, it involves those Bodie factors. One, a fundamental interest in the care, companionship, and custody of a, of a child. And two, the state has a monopoly on the means that one resolves a custody but, but, dispute. But so I think that squarely comes within that Bodie versus Connecticut. But uh, Bodie rubric. was involved the payment of a fee that, as I understand, the party couldn't afford. So you had a constitutional right to get a divorce, right. couldn't pay the fee, couldn't, but, but there's nothing like that here. You yes, just have well. To, you just have to file another piece of paper mm -hmm. uh, justifying getting permission. Well, if I could riff on the Bodie versus Connecticut case, that involved um, a couple that was seeking a divorce. If one of those um, individuals, um, the husband or wife, had been declared vexatious, they first would have had to get permission 
to ask for a dissolution. Um, right. So you the, see the situation the, the, that the, we're in. So if one of the, 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 the difference is they, as I understand, body, they didn't have the money to pay the fee, so there was no way they could get into court. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is just a requirement that you find another piece of paper. How are they, how are they analogous? Um, they're analogous in the sense that under um, the state Supreme Court case, Shallant versus Girardi, uh, which was um, issued in 2011, the state Supreme Court said that um, a person who's represented is shielded from the vexatious litigant statute. So in other words, if those two parents or two individuals in, in Bodie um, didn't have the money to pay an attorney, they would have been subject to the vexatious litigant statute. What's particularly insidious about the vexatious litigant statute is that it indirectly is a fee filing case. If one can't afford $350 an hour to pay an attorney, they're essentially SOL. They, they are a target and subject to the vexatious litigant statute. In a custody case, 85... I don't think you've answered my question. Okay. They can get a lawyer. That's another way they can get out of it. Right. But the other way is to just file a piece of paper. They know, we know they know how to file because they file all these other cases per se, so it's not like they don't know how to write English or file a pleading. So this is not a class of illiterates. Uh, these are people who know how to file papers, and this just says, okay, you also found the filing papers, file one more piece of paper. What, what's, what's the problem there? This is not like body where they, where they, can't, where they can't afford the fee. Right, this, but this is, something, this is something you and your clients can easily do. Right. Well, and and our clients have done that. Um, I was declared vexatious not once but twice. Sanctioned twenty two thousand dollars the first time, thirty three thousand the second time. Every time I've filled out the MC seven hundred two form after my uh, parental rights were terminated, every one of those has been denied, summarily denied. You have not shown changed circumstances. So I've, I haven't seen my daughter in six years. I can submit again and again and again, and I have. I could show you, and in the record, you probably will find dozens of requests and by my attorney. I've hired an attorney. She had to file the form and was also denied permission for a hearing. So in other words, if that initial custody ruling or visitation ruling, judicial determination were wrong, um, and you're declared vexatious, you're essentially locked out of court. Routinely and statistically, everyone is denied permission after they've been declared vexatious. That's just the way it's played. Even now, after Girardi saying that one is shielded from the vexatious litigant statute, if they're represented, um, you're still, you may be allowed in court, but now they use another method to keep you from having a hearing um, under the case resolution program. So once a parent is declared vexatious, they're essentially locked out of court unless they can afford an attorney. But even with the way it's interpreted, the vexatious litigant statutes interpreted and applied, it's invariably applied even against attorneys. So even if you're represented, you're denied permission and access to the court. Um, if, if the vexatious litigant statute were as simple as a straight on, straightforward fee case, um, you'd be able to see the issue. But when a parent cannot afford $350 an hour to pay an attorney, then they have to file a, a form, and they're denied permission to get into court. So in that sense, it is a fee-filing case. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, you're over your time. Let's hear from the other side. May it please the court, Patty Lee for defendants, the Chief Justice, and the Administrative Director of the courts. The court should affirm the, the district. The director is no longer before us, right? 
That's correct. The district court found that the claims against the administrative director are barred by sovereign immunity, and plaintiffs did not challenge that ruling on appeal. So you're here representing the chief justice? Yes. And uh, the claims against the chief justice also fail because of sovereign immunity, as the panel was discussing, the Chief Justice does not have a connection to the enforcement of the statute. What about Wolf versus Strankman? Uh, the Wolf versus Strankman case from 2004 uh, determined, uh, as you were alluding to, that the Chief Justice um, was, in fact, a, a proper defendant, and, and the claims against the Chief Justice at that point were not barred by sovereign immunity. But um, in making that determination, the panel's analysis was incomplete. It simply looked at whether the uh, relief sought was prospective uh, and whether the Chief Justice had been sued in his official capacity. It did not at all engage in the analysis about whether there was the required connection to enforcement, which is a, a key part of the analysis. Um, Ex parte Young what is... Can, what can we do about that? It's a Ninth Circuit opinion. We're bound by it. Um, you're, you're bound by... You go down the hall and complain to Judge Fletcher. <laughs> uh, That opinion, as I um, have mentioned, did not engage in the the full analysis. But, but counsel, Judge Kaczynski is asking you to speak to a different point, and it's my question as well. We're bound by it. So are you asking us to suggest to our colleagues that we should take this en banc, or why wouldn't we be bound by it? I'm suggesting that you're not bound by it because because it did not address the, the legal issue here, which is whether the Chief Justice had a direct connection to enforcement of the statute. And why wasn't that at issue in Strankman? I don't know why that was not addressed in the panel's... Okay, uh, but, but, but I, I asked a slightly different question. I asked, why wasn't that at issue? It may not have been addressed by the panel, but it doesn't mean that it wasn't, it wasn't a part of the analysis. In other words, we, we've got, we may have come to a conclusion. We may have jumped a step someplace in there, but we've got a panel that's come to a conclusion that the Chief Justice can be sued in his capacity as the administrator. Under this statute. So how do we, how, how do we decide that he doesn't, that he doesn't get to be, be sued as, as an administrator without going into conflict with our prior decision? I don't believe the decision would conflict because a decision by this panel finding that the Chief Justice does not have the required direct connection to enforcement would not conflict with, a finding, with the finding of the Wolf versus Strankman um, opinion because so, it simply so what is wasn't it, addressed So there. what is it that the Chief Justice, what, why is the Chief Justice not subject to, to the suit here? Because as it is alleged in the complaint, the only thing alleged in the complaint regarding the Chief Justice is that she's the chair of the Judicial Council and that the Judicial Council has a responsibility to adopt rules and procedures that are consistent with the Constitution. Does the Judicial Council maintain lists? The Judicial Council uh, maintains a list of litigants who have been, um, against whom pre-filing orders have been entered. Does it have the authority to take people off that list? Um, Judges can uh, enter an order rescinding the pre-filing order and then... Can can the members of the, can the Judicial Council... No, the Judicial Council cannot act independently to remove anyone from the list. It's just a ministerial responsibility. It's a purely ministerial administrative responsibility. If we were to issue an order to the Chief Justice to remove certain names from that list, would the Chief Justice follow our our order? Uh, I don't know that the Chief Justice could follow that order without it being in conflict with what the statute requires. Can't they just take somebody off the list? If, Uh, if If something is found unconstitutional... Um, it, it may be, it may be uh, administratively possible for the Chief Justice to uh, direct someone that someone's name be removed from the list, but it would not be in conformance with the statute. So if it were part of a ruling that the, that the statute um, were unconstitutional, then that, that may all work uh, as a practical matter. But in terms of uh, sovereign immunity, our, our position is that it would not be appropriate because the Chief Justice is not really, uh, has no connection to the actual enforcement of the statute. Um, what, if we, what if we decide we're bound by Strankman? Can you, could you go to the merits? Yes, if the panel decides that it is bound by Strankman, uh, the claims are still barred because uh, the statute survives rational basis review. Why is it rational basis review given? His, his argument is that this is a parental right, and that there are Supreme Court cases acknowledging that that's entitled to heightened scrutiny. Yes, the default rule uh, in terms of 
pre-filing requirements for civil litigation are that those requirements receive rational basis review. There have been limited exceptions uh, made in which heightened scrutiny has been applied in the family law context, but those exceptions um, are for very specific circumstances. For In the Bodie case, for filing for divorce, uh, and in the MLB case, for appealing the termination of parental rights. Um, and those are the only two instances in which the Supreme Court has found that some form of heightened scrutiny can apply. I, I think that your brief argues that this is, um, in, in this circumstance, because it's not a, a bar to the courthouse doors, that the, the right at issue is being infringed um, less significantly. But why isn't the right itself entitled to heightened, heightened scrutiny? We're talking about the parent-child relationship, and the Supreme Court has certainly acknowledged that that's entitled to heightened scrutiny, right? Um, it, it's true that uh, things governing the, the parent-child relationship are um, certainly protected by the Constitution. Um, however, there is no guarantee of unrestricted access to the courts for the That's purpose. That's a different point. But Troxel uh, refers to this as a as a fundamental right, doesn't it? Yes, but the, but but in this instance, um, the the litigants, any litigant subject to the statute, still has access to the courts in order to try to vindicate those rights. Right, and that's what I was just speaking to. It seems to me your argument is that the right at issue is being infringed less significantly, and I think much less significantly, since there's still an ability to go in and, and file. Yes, that, and that, that is certainly, uh, that's an important factor under the cases. In Bodhi, um, there was no ability to file if you didn't pay the fee, mm -hmm. and in MLB, there was no ability to pursue an appeal if you didn't pay the record preparation fee. So in, in both those instances, there was simply no way around it if you couldn't uh, afford. Does this statute survive heightened scrutiny if we decide heightened scrutiny is appropriate? Yes, the statute would survive heightened scrutiny because um, it, it is narrowly tailored and there have been uh, various California state courts uh, decisions finding that it is narrowly tailored. Um, the statute does not apply across the board to all pro se litigants. It only applies uh, to litigants who have previously been determined to have abused the court system in some manner. Um, and as, uh, as was discussed previously, it is possible for a litigant to, to still file cases even after they've been um, put on this uh, list. They, can, um, ju they just need to make a showing uh, that the case has some merit and has not been filed for the purposes well, the, of harassment. The, uh, um, opposing counsel seems to claim that this is, never happens, that effectively this is a bar. That, I can't, that seems to be his claim. The, the standard is not a high one. It is the same type of standard that would be applied once the, the case made it into uh, the courtroom and had been briefed by both sides and, and, um, and argued. So is it, that the significant change of circumstances standard necessary to change custody? Is that the standard you're no, speaking No, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking more generally about the, the threshold determination that the judge must make about whether to allow uh, newly proposed litigation to proceed. Right, but is it the same, if it's the same standard, I understood opposing counsel okay. to say he, he was denied because, because he hadn't shown a s significant change in circumstances. Yes, so, so in evaluating whether the case has merit, the judge right. would, would look at whether there is any showing of a, of a change in circumstances. So that's the same standard for the change of custody or visitation, isn't it? Yes, it is the okay. same standard. Um, so... So the access is, is still preserved. There, it, is, it, is not, um, it is not something that, that applies wholesale to all pro se litigants. As I was saying, it applies only to those who have been previously determined by a judge to have abused the, their access to the judicial system and used it to harass others. Um, and the, the showing that needs to be made in order to receive permission to file is, is very similar to uh, the, the same showing that um, would need to be made in order for the litigation to to proceed. Um, and so uh, for, for those reasons, we think the, the statute is narrowly tailored, and it certainly serves a, the compelling interest in um, safeguarding against abuse of the court system and the use of the court system um, to, to harass others or to, or to repeatedly relitigate um, claims that have already been decided. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're over your time. Would you like to take a minute for a bottle? Um, yes, I would. Um, you know, in, in terms of the uh, Wolf versus Strankman case, um, um, again, we're, we're making a general challenge. We're not, you know, we, we sued the Chief Justice because we're not making a de facto collective appeal. 
we're making a general challenge to the vexatious litigant statute. Again, we don't believe it's nar narrowly ta tailored because um, all the parents who, who are declared vexatious um, then have to go through the hurdle or the bar of filling out these forms. And as experience has shown, all of us, once you're declared vexatious, you're essentially denied any access to the court, irrespective of, of um, an ongoing custody dispute. A civil case is very different. Custody cases and visitation matters can go on for years and years and years. It's not that these parents are being vexatious. It's not that they're harassing people. To say that a parent who wants to restore visitation or custody is harassing by filing frivolous litigation just seems to be vindictive, and it seems to fail to distinguish between a civil litigant and a parent in a custody case, half of whom were not even the ones who initiated the dissolution proceeding, half of whom were drawn into court. Um, and under the statute, it says... Well, but but they, they had to have done quite a bit on their own uh, to have gotten on the list. Right. And under the... So it's not like you know, they, were, they were constantly being sued and here I am showing up. Because... Right. But I'm just saying in a custody dispute, if a parent is represented, they are protected from the vexatious litigant statute. Those repeated filings for visitation aren't counted as vexatious because they're represented. On the other hand, an unrepresented parent who has neither the knowledge or the ability files these, and then the represented parent can say, hey, all these repeated efforts to restore visitation, and those are counted as vexatious. While they're not counted against... How many strikes do you need to get to get on the list? How many strikes? How many cases? What, what does it take to get on the list? Well, five litigations within a seven-year period. The, the problem is in a, in a civil Excuse suit... Excuse me, does that mean, forgive me, but five litigations, does that mean five motions to modify within a seven-year period, or what's... Well, you know, that's a good question. Under Section 371D, um, um, after you've been declared vexatious, then any motion you file is considered litigation. Okay, but I'm, I, my question is, and I think Judge Kaczynski was asking, what's it take to get on the list? In well, practice, in section, really well, take? repeated, uh, um, they use the word repeated motions, which is the way I think most parents are involved in that because they, they request, um, you know, changes in visitation or changes in, in in um, custody. What about child support? What about repeated motions for child support? Does that count? Those would be counted as as, as um, vexatious. Alimony charges, vexatious. What happens is eventually in a, in a parent dispute with custody, which goes on for two or three years, even the represented parent who will lose two or three or four would be considered vexatious. But that parent, because they're represented, is shielded from a vexatious litigant motion by the fact of representation. The unrepresented parent, who filed just as many, could be declared vexatious. So there's an equal protection aspect to this as well. Privileges and immunity. Represented parent is immune from being declared vexatious. A represented parent is also has the privilege of bringing a vexatious litigant motion against the unrepresented parent. So the unrepresented parent who can afford an attorney, um, Justice Zelon, who is chair of the um, Elkins Task Force, a big case that came down, um, she noted in her Elkin Task Force recommendations that money should be made available so a parent won't be a target, an unrepresented parent won't be a target of a vexatious litigant motion. Unfortunately, there aren't funds, and in the statute that she provided, there were limited funds for that. So that's, that's what's at issue here. In the sense you don't have the money to hire an attorney, this case functions as a pre-filing case. It involve, it, it it entails the Bodhi factors, fundamental interest in custody, and the state mo monopolization of. of thank you. Thank you. Thank you.